Hi everyone. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate again, thank you to the Fulbright Commission for this opportunity and for us all. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and thank you all for being here as well. I'm learning so much from each of you and it's informing my research as this process goes. So it's interesting. Um, so yeah, I am a doctoral candidate at the University of California Riverside in ethnomusicology. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so anyways, the title of my project is called Nueva Canción, the soundtrack of Chilean exile in East Germany. Um, sorry, this is a really yeah. unfortunate situation. <laughs> 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 Anyways, um, I normally like to start like a class or a lecture with um, listening to some music. I think I'll hold off on the end though. So I just want to talk a little bit about like the history behind this project. Um, so uh, most of the time, you know, when even amongst Latin American scholars talking about Chile during the times of the military, during the military dictatorship, every presentation begins on September 11th, 1973. Da, da, da. And uh, I'm gonna, I think that we're all pretty probably good uh, with a lot of the historical information. But regarding some of the exile um, policy and uh, and the circumstances surrounding uh, exile. Um, so there were approximately 200,000 Chilean citizens that were uh, forcibly exiled or fled, uh, fleeing um, political or physical violence to more than 100 countries around the world. Um, East Germany received approximately 5,000 political refugees. Uh, as, and also other countries, including like the USSR, former Czechoslovakia, and other Soviet states uh, received you know, several thousand more. The relationship between Chile and Germany uh, is very strong going back to you know the end of World War II, particularly um, in, with the West after the post-World War II division between the East and West in Germany. Um, one of the probably most notable legacies of this relationship during like the middle of the 20th century would be the uh, Goethe Institute over just a couple blocks over there. Um, uh, but there were lots of, uh, regarding music, there were lots of Composers, uh, you know, that were supported from various countries in uh, in Europe, but really strongly in Germany, that were supported by grants from the Chilean government to come over. Um, after the transfer um, of um, and the Allende presidency, there was a lot more interaction and involvement between Chile and former East Germany. Um, probably in terms of cultural and artistic projects, most notably, you have. Uh, um, a lot of musicians and artists going over to study, perform concerts. Probably most notably would be people like uh, Angel Parra and Isabel Parra uh, performing at these sort of uh, political song festivals in uh, East Germany. Uh, also, you know, naturally Inti Limani and Kila Payun were uh, really involved in this as well. Um, at the moment of the, the Golpe, two <coughs> ensembles, Inti Limani and Kila Payun, who we'll hear a little bit from in a moment, were on tour in Europe, and Eduardo Carrasco from Quilapayun and Horacio Salinas from Intilimani kind of uh, described this experience as being marooned in uh, Europe for a period of about 15 years, which kind of precipitated uh, 15 years of uh, solidarity concerts um, and really strong political activism all around Europe, Canada, other countries in Central America, less in the United States. Um, but definitely there's a strong uh, touring aspect um, throughout all of the countries in the East uh, and former Eastern Europe. Um, ch there were networks of uh, exiled Chileans, uh, political networks, literary networks, people producing political magazines uh, and journals. And then uh, for my purposes, what's kind of most interesting is the development of the Peñas, uh, which are these kind of coffee house, social, political gatherings where people would get together. Uh, you'd sing songs from artists like Victor Parra or uh, Violeta Parra, uh, and then you'd talk about, you know, uh, Marxism and things like that. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, these things still, these groups still meet. Um, there's one that meets very regularly, for example, in Dresden, uh, you know, every month or so. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, research about the experience of leftist political exiles living in countries like France and Switzerland and Holland who had much more robust um, 
like hosting policies receiving they receive much larger uh, numbers of uh, Chilean political exiles but there's really kind of comparatively little information um, about uh, the experience of exile in the East under like real socialism or real communism definitely there, there were socialist parties and you know in Paris and in Rome and in places like that that were the sites for a lot of um, political and intellectual and solidarity discussions and protests but there's there's a lot less um, information about what's happening in the East um, and you know these same musical recordings for example or same musical concerts uh, meant different things in different circumstances you know so for example in France uh, the music became much more commercialized. It was much. It was really common, like you know, in the 1970s or 80s, to hear like Intilimani playing on the radio um, in like a grocery store or something like that. In East Germany, comparatively, this music really became an arm of the the, the government and was really used as a social propaganda tool. You know, our, look at our uh, communist brothers who are you know fighting in solidarity, um, and. And it was also used to kind of generate a kind of a more global politi political identity for East Germany, which um, I just want to move along, sorry. Um, there's, so even though this music functioned differently in different countries, so obviously like a recording or a disc or a concert had a different sort of social and political meaning between a place like Paris and a place like what East Berlin or Moscow during this time period. It also had a different recording within the same context. So you have to think like, you know, on stage we'd be listening to an Anhal Pada concert and in the audience you would have, uh, you know, exiled Ch uh, Chilean community, um, you'd have state bureaucrats, you'd have East German teenagers who are protesting, you know, with punk music and wanting to tear down the wall and, re and reunite and reunify Germany. And then you have someone like, you know, like, you know, political government figures. So there, so this music is meaning a lot of different things for all these different people in the same sort of context. So I'm really curious about how specifically this music functioned for the political and social identity of the Chilean exile community that formed in uh, East Germany. Uh, so, and this is a documentary from DIFA Film Studios, the Deutsche Film Axien Gesellschaft, which is a documentary on um, the kind of legacies of Nueva Cancion in East Germany. Uh, and this, uh, we'll listen to a little bit at the end. This is uh, Kila Payun playing Solidaritat's lead, um, recorded under Amiga Records in East Berlin. Um, if anybody's interested in this, I can share this presentation. Yeah. So, let's see. so, just uh, in terms of like progress and project advancements, so this is. The Nueva Cancion in general, and Chilean pop music in general, is an extremely well-researched um, phenomenon uh, from scholars all around the world, uh, from Latin American scholars, from Amer uh, scholars in the United States, from Europe. Um, so I'm working specifically with uh, Dr. Daniel Parti at the Universidad Católica, who is a specialist in Chilean popular music, but I have uh, connections and, um, and I'll be working also with uh, people like Juan Pablo Gonzalez who's at uh, uh, Universidad Alberto Hurtado and he's probably like the, the, the guy for Chilean popular music going back you know 30 uh, years or so um, uh, and uh, so there's just like a really robust sc sc scholarly community here um, and then, so in addition to this kind of scholastic community, there's a lot of institutional connections that I'll be working with. So, for example, working with the Goethe <coughs> Institute, working with the Museo de la Memoria y de los Derechos Humanos. Um, I've had um, meetings with these people and we're really excited to develop lots of uh, projects are in development right now. Uh, there's a lot of um, digital uh, database projects, there's a lot of education projects, there's a lot of concerts and uh, um, performances and things like that that will be really exciting to see how these uh, transpire over the next couple of months. Um, and let, speaking about these uh, digital projects, so I'm working currently with uh, Cantos Cautivos. It's a little bit different, it's, uh, it's a testimonial database of um, uh, songs that were uh, written or were used in some sort of political or therapeutic manner in prisons and concentration camps during the um, 
uh, during the dictatorship. I'm working with Katia Chornik, who's a professor at University of Manchester. We're developing some educational materials for using these testimonies um, in context outside of Chile. So for example, using them as educational materials in North America. Um, Trayectorias is a sponsored by the Goethe Institute, and it's a kind of a long-standing project about the exchange between Latin America and Germany regarding music. Uh, Estrategias Uplicuas is a yearly, I think it's a yearly event that uh, focuses, uh, it's not uh, oblique strategies from, um, what's his name, not David Byrne, Brian Eno, uh, which is another sort, uh, sort of thing entirely. This is a kind of a historical analysis of, uh, uh, and there's presentations, there's a conference, there's performances uh, of uh, looking at the history of electronic music in different circumstances. This year, excitingly, there's a partnership between the Goethe Institute and the Museum of Memory, uh, looking specifically at the relationship of, between Chile and Germany in the 1980s and 90s and the development of uh, uh, electronic music. So really focusing on the next generation after the exile community, like the children who went on to become artists and electronic musicians. Uh, Memorias de Exilo is another online database project which I'm hoping to be working with, and this is another uh, oral testimony archive that's uh, run by the Museo de la Memoria. Um, in addition, I've been taking some meetings and developing connections with like individuals, non-music scholars, and professional mu professional musicians. So I've been meeting, for example, I had uh, coffee the other day with the um, former subsecretary of the Ministry of Culture under Michelle Bachelet, who's uh, really excited about this project, and she's really wanting to help me develop a strong, uh, wanting to facilitate a lot of resources for me, which is really exciting. Um, so research methods, so ethnomusicology, it's not ethnic musicology, it's ethnographic musicology. So we'll be employing ethnographic techniques so interviews, spending long time periods of time. I think most of us are probably familiar with like what an ethnography is. Uh, documenting lots of oral histories, recording, video. One thing that is really crucial to uh, ethnomusicology, though, is uh, participation in musical events. So you know we might call this participant observation. Uh, so I have a background in classical guitar. I used to teach classical guitar, and I was a musician for many years. And so I can kind of. Uh, add that experience to um, performances and other situations as the as it comes up. But participation also involves like dancing, attending concerts, promoting concerts, publicizing concerts, uh, setting up events, and things like that. So this is all part of mu this kind of musical participation. Um, and then volunteering with various institutions. So like for example, I told you I'm like working on this uh, education-based project with uh, Katia Chornik. Uh, the cantos cautivos. So there's going to, so and there's other sort of opportunities that are kind of in the works right now to do educate um, volunteer type work. Uh, potential obstacles. So the, the, there's a really serious potential obstacle, which is the identification of these communities. So it's not like a super large community of people that that lived in exile dur during the military dictatorship in East Germany. So there's a serious question, like, is there a there there um, that I think is really worth pursuing? Um, a lot of people seem to be saying, yes, there is. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how it develops and how um, really how much re resources I can uh, acquire based on, about the experiences of uh, Chilean exile in East Germany. And obviously gaining access. You know, There's a lot of unposted political events, uh, un unposted musical events. There's a lot of uh, political meetings and things like that that I'm trying to gain access to, and uh, that's you know that's something that's going to take some time. Um, but it seems like you know some of the barriers are coming down already, and people who are gatekeepers are helping me to open doors and things like that. So that's exciting. And then um, how to talk and ask questions. Uh, someone was talking about this a little bit, you know, when doing interviews about the kind of legacies of trauma. Uh, political violence, uh, exile, this is like a really heavy topic, you know, obviously. Um, there's a lot of research and methodologies about, you know, conducting interviews with people who've been uh, victims of political violence, but this is, um, you know, something that I have to keep in mind. I, like in an interview that I had just a couple days ago, you know, someone began crying uh, because of just like the, the, the strength of 
this topic. So you know, this is something that I have to be really sensitive about and kind of continually assess my perspective and my role in the in this process. Um, and then establishing links between. So this is more like my sort of problem. It's not really like an obstacle, but it's just thinking about. So you know. There's people who are experts in music, but maybe didn't live in exile. There's people who live in exile, but have no strong like musical relationship. So there's, there's archival materials, there's objects. How do all these things fit together? This isn't like, you know, there's this community of people that I'm gonna work with that are gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do this ethnographic research in this one place, and there's gonna be like a project at the end. There's a lot of different moving parts to it, and so I have to kind of figure out if and how all these things will fit together. Um, and then, just really quickly, so the kind of like ba most basic level of like you know goals and implications that's you know maybe like less interesting for everyone here is like there's just like a dearth of information about you know uh, uh, ethnographic research, um, oral histories, uh, musical research regarding the experience of Chilean exile in Eastern East Germany and Eastern Europe in general. So that's really useful for ethnomusicology, anthropology, maybe history. Um, what's sort of more interesting in some ways is uh, there's a kind of a, dis a narrativizing of the Cold War uh, that kind of persists in a lot of Western scholarship that I notice, and we see people more and more kind of focusing on more like smaller slices of, of uh, Cold War experience, focusing on individuals, focusing on like everyday acts of revolution or rebellion, things like that, and uh, to kind of resist some of these like more like binary classifications that are maybe linked to more like you know, uh, like kind of government-directed research or research directed by political figures or research directed by, in a more sort of uh, kind of capitalist narrative, which I think is something that's still really persistent in talking about uh, Cold War dynamics to this day. Um, more so, um, this project I hope also can anal can maybe provide a model or just some ways of thinking about the role of music in refugee dynamics. Uh, um, and this is something that I have to think about more is like, you know, what does like, a refugee dynamic mean and how does music fit into it? I'm really grateful for you, your terminology and thinking about this stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's really uh, exciting. Um, sorry, and, but yeah, how can music be used in education both within and about uh, refugee politics? And then finally, um, just looking at music now, and I, when I developed this project, it was before October, and music is really uh, a crucial part of what's going on in Chile now, and I'm really excited to see um, how the legacies of this music uh, continue to political protests and manifestations in Chile today. This music, um, just really quickly, for example, and you know, uh, a couple years ago in Nicaragua, there were massive protests uh, against the um, Ortega presidency, right? I think mo most of us are familiar with this, at least generally. And what was the music that was punctuating these these protests? Does anybody, did anybody happen to notice this? It's un pueblo unido, jamás ha vencido. So music from Chile from the 1970s. And, uh, yeah, so it's interesting to think about. Um, I can quickly, how's it, how are we doing on time? Yeah. Yeah, let me play like 30 <laughs> seconds. So this is uh, Kila Payun singing in German. In... In a... Up. <laughs> Where's the... Yeah, so this is recorded in East Germany, 1978, Amiga Records. And most of us are pretty probably familiar at least a little bit with Oops. Anyways, we can listen to more of that later. But anyways, and this is all brothers unite, move forward in times of hunger, in times of uh, famine, in times of feast, it will we'll join together, stop fighting amongst each other, let's unify, and there's a, um, so yeah, you know, all this kind of good communist uh, <laughs> brothers join forces and things like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. thank you. Yeah.